It's the theme of the movie! Everyone and their dog wanted us to review this movie. Why? Why is it so engaging? Why was I able to sit down for an hour and 38 minutes and forget that there's a reality outside of Burke? Here, watch this. That was easy. Ah, uh, cut. That's nice. Lunch, lunch, lunch. You know, I can go for that. But seriously, watch that. And if you own the DVD, watch it with the director's commentary because it's clear from both of those why How to Train Your Dragon is such a good movie. It's because of the father-son relationship. They talk about, in both instances, how they just got rid of everything else to really make that relationship rise to the top so it can be as emotionally engaging as possible. But it's not just the father-son relationship, it's the story of the father-son relationship. It's the drama of wants, expectations, and decisions. Conflicts on conflicts. It's the clarity, vulnerability, and cohesive thematic elements. That's why we all love the film, and that's why we're reviewing it. So, here you go. Drama. It's interesting. It's the gap between what a character wants and what he gets. It's the Disney Channel secret that no one can know about. It's the Wizard of Waverly Place. <laughs> Hannah Montana. Thirteenth year. It's the fill of the future. It's the... That's so rape though. Oh my gosh, how are we gonna get out of this? It's the love triangle. We'll explain that one later. This sticky spider web of what Hiccup desires against what he receives is why we stay completely entranced in the whole story of How to Train Your Dragon. Are you ready? So Hiccup initially wants to be accepted. He wants to feel like he's fulfilled his destiny to become a Viking. And he measures that by status. And how do you gain status? By killing dragons. So we now know that the Viking worldview is that we kill dragons because they threaten our livelihood. And that's when things get interesting. Hiccup gets what he wants. He has the opportunity to kill a dragon. And if he did, well, they'd have to change the name of the movie. How to kill your dragon slowly with a butter knife is a far less kid-friendly name. But he doesn't. For whatever reason, he wouldn't and then couldn't kill a dragon thus failing his own test to be a Viking. Which causes his ideals to change. He is no longer driven to be accepted by the Vikings, but rather to learn more about dragons, and consequently be friends toothless. And by learning more about dragons, he gets what he initially wanted, status and acceptance. But he doesn't want it anymore, because by gaining what he initially wanted, he's forced to become something that he knows he cannot be. And it's this gap that makes the story engaging. Each side of Hiccup's life directly and irreversibly affects the other side, but each side also happens to be at odds with the other. Each time he learns something new about dragons, he gains status, and with that status comes a greater expectation for him to be able to kill dragons, which is something that Hiccup just can't do. This sucks us in. It causes us to invest in this mess that Hiccup's in. An interesting point in the commentary was this scene when Astrid like takes down Hiccup and then drops her axe on them. To them in the production scene, it was a really funny scene. But what was interesting is when they showed it to an audience, they found it more stressful than funny. She's about to uncover the secret to find out about Hiccup's other life that is against her and the Vikings worldview and could put Toothless at risk. That's a great place to have your audience. I'd take that over a slapstick gag any day. And that's why the end is so satisfying. Toothless and Stoic represent the two worlds that Hiccup's trying to balance. And coincidentally, their relationships with Hiccup are the most developed throughout the entire film. Weird. But this love triangle, though, it is the whole film. I mean, we empathize with both sides and why they're at odds with each other. They're just trying to protect their peeps, which only pushes the conflict because we're not 100% against anyone. And that's why the crisis is so impactful. When they're off to the nest with Toothless, we feel helpless, lost. Hiccup's best friend is bound up and viewed as a monster, and his father has just severed their relationship and is sailing off to what could be his and Toothless's doom. That's good storytelling right there. The main resolution of the entire movie is this scene right here. If after this, big man McKay dies like, mmm, toasted Viking, nice even a toothpick. Honestly, we'd still be satisfied. Sure, we'd be upset and we'd throw things at the screen, but we'd still be satisfied in that the story the movie set out to tell was resolved. Here, the love triangle is complete. This is where Stoic, the embodiment of what a Viking is and the traditional views of things, accepts new ideas and change, which is what Toothless embodies. And, I mean, it helps that these are two characters we care about a lot in the movie, but this is Stoic saying, Everything that I was saying was wrong. We shouldn't kill these guys, and we should just live in peace. 
together. Except for that one right there. Let's kill that one. Because, you know, they had that one scene where he, like, was shown as a cannibal. And that makes the audience be like, ooh, he's bad. So, even though not killing a dragon is what started this movie, we should kill it. As stated before, Hiccup's relationships with Stoic and Toothless are the main story of the film. However, those relationships are also representative of the theme, something like it's beneficial to be open and accept new ideas. Toothless represents new ideas and Stoke represents the old way. And can we just stop and appreciate how cool it is to embed in thematic elements into relationships? I mean, I didn't feel like a moron having these, it's about new ideas. It was just, it was in the characters and I freaking liked the characters and they really drove home the story. Dean, I'm all right guy, let's hang out sometime. But was it enough for the two relationships with the most screen time to hint at the theme? Absolutely not. Enter the supporting cast. Fishleg, Snotlout, Roughnut, and Toughnut are all also representative of the old Viking culture. And don't even get me started on Astrid. She's dripping in the stuff. In the arena scene, we see that her Viking warrior prowess is predicated on the understanding that there is only one way to keep Burke safe. Be a Viking. Kill some dragon. And because of her strong stance on old Viking culture, it's really important that she's the first person to see Hiccup's worldview. I mean, he had to take her on a proverbial magic carpet ride before she understood, but I mean, who wouldn't be persuaded by the miracle of flight via one ton reptile? Man, this, this scene is like the Mega Man X intro stage of movie scenes. Every movie, you know, needs some level of exposition at the beginning to let you know what's going on. But this, it sets up everything in the first five minutes. No, freaking seconds of the film. It's amazing! While maintaining a really interesting and intense battle scene. Here's a couple of things they set up, but there's so much more. They live on an island. Dragons, bad. Hiccup, main character. He doesn't quite fit in. Stoic, he's the chief. And BA. Gobber and what his and Hiccup's relationship looks like. Hiccup's role in the village. The entire secondary cast. Astrid. But seriously though, take this shot. Like, it is the only overly clear shot of him giving any romantic interest into Astrid. It's, is that enough to make the relationship later solid? Obvi. Yeah, so good. It also sets up how the people of Burke view dragons. Shoots down the dragon that starts the whole movie. Hiccups wants and ideals. You know, yeah, this guy. Sup, Pops? And how the relationship between Hiccup and Stoic is not really simpatico. We learn all this stuff visually and we're just in it. And because you're in it, it doesn't feel like it's a exposition dump. I mean, sure the whole time we kind of set up this whole thing where Hiccup's telling us things first person, but imagine if he was telling it all to us like the day after the battle. There's so many things in this scene that we just kind of see to understand. I mean, Hiccup's not running into battle like he's supposed to be there. He kind of weaves in and out of traffic. Cool. He doesn't belong. Dragons are a real threat. They light houses on fire. Awesome. And the other kids have cooler jobs because they do fit in, and they don't cause a ruckus. Plus, I mean, people with explosions behind them, obviously more attractive. And it's incredible how this whole scene sets up the entire foundation for the rest of the film. And anything we learn for the rest of the film is at the same time as Hiccup. One incredible feat of this film is its use of pantomime, letting the acting do more of the storytelling than the dialogue. We talked about this a little bit in our Frozen review, but pantomime has an interesting place in the world of character development. It's naked, vulnerable, honest, and we real life humans speak way more with our actions than we do our words, and we tend to trust people's body language a lot more. And when you let actions do more of the heavy lifting of storytelling, your characters come across as so much deeper and emotionally engaging. That's why Hiccup, Stoic, and Toothless are such likable characters. The movie really gives us this glimpse of soft, quiet moments that really let us see how the character's really feeling. That's why this scene hurts. And this scene. A small but well done example of this is Astrid. I mentioned earlier how that whole Astrid scene is the only like overly clear scene showing that Hiccup has any romantic interest in Astrid. Which is kind of true, but not really because we have scenes where he's like, so I guess it's just you and me, huh? Or so I guess we'll share. Which does awkwardly tell the audience that he wants alone time with her. But it's so subtle. It can be just as easily missed. But at the same time, if you do pick up on it, you now know Hiccup's intentions in a deeper sense because you saw how he acted around her. Thus telling you that Hiccup wants to take Astrid, put her on his dragon, and show her what time it is. But without shoving it down your throat and reminding you that he's a fictional character in a fictional world. And related to that is time. Something that I've thought of recently and for the most part hold to be true is the idea that an image tells a story, but time makes you care. 
Feel free to give me feedback on that. But it highlights the necessity of giving an audience time to spend with a moment, an idea, a character to make it feel significant. I mean, anybody can flip through a comic book, see an individual frame, and understand that frame and the context of that story visually, and then flip the page. But does that make you care about that character? I'd argue no. There has to be some level of time spent with that character in order to give him dimension. One really cool part of the commentary of the movie is around an hour and 16 minutes when Dean talks about when Stoic and Gobber see the kids fly by on dragons for the first time. He talks about initially they like planned like that was the moment that uh, Stoic turned. He like said to Gobber like, wow, that, there you go, I was wrong. But they decided later on that they needed to give him more time to kind of mull on the idea and let him like just sit on it a while. So then when he does like flip when he goes to save Toothless, like that's the time and that gives him more dimension. The music in How to Train Your Dragon is awesome. All in favor? All right then, it's unanimous. It's rich and it stylistically deepens the world in which the story exists and by featuring instruments that we can associate with one single culture. In this case, Scottish culture. By using instruments like bagpipes and penny whistles, we're able to just kind of like feel the environment that much more. So a flute sounds different than a trumpet. Here is a flute playing middle C. And here's a trumpet playing middle C. You can tell which one's a flute because it's, it's lighter, airier. A trumpet is more brash, it's more in your face. This is referred to as timbre. The use and reuse of a melody to express a character, tone, or idea is referred to as a musical theme. For instance, the pew 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 is used to identify Toothless as well as themes of acceptance, change, and new ideas. Like when Hiccup gains control of Toothless and flies for the first time on his own, guess which theme is playing? Change. Dragons aren't what we thought they were, and we can fly now. So now, note the timbre that is being used every time we hear Toothless's theme. Strings, flutes, mallet keyboards, female voices, softer instruments. And here's the timbre of the Viking. Brass, male voices, like just bigger, harsh. Okay, you ready? Because here's the music that is playing when Stoic saves Toothless. Eh? Huh? Yeah? Mind blown? Probably. John Powell is using Toothless's theme and the timbre that he has already associated with the Vikings, essentially further deepening the theme of the movie, that stoic in the traditional Viking worldview has changed and now accepted that everything they knew about dragons was wrong. Now, as, ugh, that's awesome. As that moment is, I don't know, settle down. It is one of those things that is more subconscious to the typical viewer, but I don't think it's all for naught. Having clear, beautiful, consistent musical themes can really help deepen and enrich a story to exaggerate how it makes you feel. And when you think back to a movie, how it made you feel is something that sticks. The tone. I wish I had more examples of scores that attempt to do storytelling to that extent, but I don't. And that doesn't mean they're not out there, but I do think it's something that isn't explored as much, or at the very least, talked about as much. I hope in the future we really start seeing and like, recognizing scores that take storytelling to that level rather than just reflecting the story, which there's nothing wrong with that. Tell a story, period. But if you could take advantage of all the mediums available to you to tell your story, it can only deepen it. How to Train Your Dragon is engaging because of how the story structure continually widens the gap between Hiccup's wants and the reality of his situation, creating drama, which is used as a vehicle to reveal dimensions of the main character. The story is simple and clear with strong, rich character beats that allow the audience to participate in its progression and character development. And as the saying goes, the story's been told a million times, but the environment, the characters, and the story structure have a lot to do with if it's a captivating retelling of the story. So use it. I mean, I'd watch that. What do you guys think? But seriously, what do you guys think? You know, I'd let like us know in the know. comments. John likes to know. I read all of those things. He doesn't. But I actually no, do. No, I read real them life all. read those. I, I read like some. I'm a little 30, 30, 70. I care. You guys bring up some awesome stuff, and we should do those talkbacks again. Those were a good idea. It was an idea. Rude. It was a great idea. John's making an Instagram for us. Whoa! That moving was my on, point to nope, make. Moving on from MySpace. Nope, we're starting growing over. up in the world. Stop. Yeah, follow us on Twitter. 
to actually follow us on Tumblr because I actually read that. He does that thing. You guys got me into Tumblr. Fun fact. I mean, press buttons if you want. Subscribe, I think. Is Do that. Standard. I'm planning on releasing a limited edition 4,000 subscribers. He's lying about that. I'm not. I'll real life do it. I don't care if you subscribe. Just comment. That's all I care about. All right. This is way too long. Have a great week, day, half a year. It could be a while. At the rate we're going, we'll never do another one. No, don't tell them that. No, we're real life gonna do another one. Gotta even if it means that.